Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever time of day this video finds you. My name is Pete Boyd, Associate Pastor at Calvary Baptist Church here in Jessup, Georgia. I am glad that you decided to tune in. So no matter if you stay for four minutes or the whole ride, thank you and welcome. This week's Sunday School lesson for June 28th is going to be titled, The Demand for Deliberate Decision Making. And we're looking at the last two thirds of Proverbs chapter four. And we're going through the book of Proverbs this summer. And so right now, we're focusing on today's topic, dealing with decisions. You can't go through the book of Proverbs without realizing this. God is a God who has given you decisions to make. And you have to make them. And you need to be careful about what you decide. Let's pray before we get going. Father God, I thank you so much that you've given us this great opportunity, this beautiful church, to study your word. And I pray, Father God, that whatever distractions may find people on the other side of this camera i pray that you will help them to focus on what your holy spirit is saying through your word they are not tuning in to listen to me i'm just an average guy just an average man average in intellect Lord, we need your holy spirit to anoint this time and open our eyes why so we can be more like your son jesus may we be open to receive the word but also be willing in our hearts to do it we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Imagine going to school at the University of Jerusalem and you're taking a class called Decisions 101. The best teacher on earth, probably, you know, in the history of Israel would be Professor Solomon. Got a lot of degrees, a lot of PhDs, if you will. And if he were to teach us about decisions, he would probably use the passage of scripture that we're dealing with today in Proverbs 4, verses 11 through 27. And there are four things that, that Professor Solomon wants us to notice and let's get into it time is short first thing we need to know about from this section is that you have choices today alone think about this most of you decided what time you're going to wake up you decided what you were going to wear today you decided what foods you were going to eat you just, most of you decided what type of activities you would take place in that's just in the physical role we have choices hundreds of them over the course of a day if you really think about it and god not only gives you choices in the physical world, but he also gives you choices in the spiritual world. And in this passage, King Solomon is telling you, you have choices to make. And there are four things that I want to single out in, in this section. Choices you have to make. I have a choice in what? First thing is what? What I study. It starts off in verse 13. Take fast hold of what? Instruction. What else do we read later on in the chapter? Attend to my word, son. Incline your ear unto my sayings. Now, we don't have King Solomon walking in the hallways of this church, nor do you have King Solomon at your house teaching you. We have, some, we have someone far greater. We have God's Holy Spirit who is teaching us through his word, through the scriptures. And Proverbs makes up this, and Solomon is telling his son, boy, you need to choose what you're going to study. And we are supposed to choose each day what we're to study, and we are to choose to select and study God's word. And quite frankly, the average Christian in today's church in America, we simply are not studying God's Word enough. We're not letting it seep into our minds. Because you're going to find out that we have four choices to make each day in terms of the spiritual world. And it all revolves around what we study. People believe in a lot of crazy stuff today. Why? Because they're not grounded in the Word of God. We as Christians should never be dissuaded. We should never be persuaded by this world and all these crazy theories that people are coming up with because we should have a, a solid foundation on what we know to be true because of what we choose to study if we choose God's Word. People say that it's amazing what people will, will not believe. The more people I meet in 2020, to me what's more surprising is the stuff that people are willing to believe. But when you reject God's truth, all that's left are a bunch of lies. And that's why our society is in the mess it's in, because we have walked away from the Word of God, because we have chosen not to study God's Word. My friend, you have a choice each day. You have a choice in what you study, but also you have a choice in where you settle. Where do your feet go? King Solomon talks about the path of the wicked. He says, don't go that way. Don't go the way of evil men. And then in verses 26 through 27, he says this, ponder the path of your feet. Let all thy ways be established. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. So when it, we're talking about where our feet take us during the course of the day. First thing King Solomon says is this. We need to ponder. What does that mean? That means we need to think. Many of us 
are going out into the world each day. When we crank up the car, we know we're going to the store. We know we're going to work. We know we're going to grandma's house. We know ahead of time, most of the time when we crank up a car in the morning, where we're going. Well, King Solomon says do that in the spiritual world as well. When, before you get going to the course of the day, know where your feet are going to take you to. Imagine when you go off on vacation. You go off to a city that you don't know that well. And, and you get out of your hotel room or some rental house or cabin. You get in the car and you know, your whole family, you crank it up and you say, hey, we're going to go get something to eat. And you go down the main strip of town. And if you don't know which restaurant you're going to, my friend, there's going to be some problems. Because you're going in a foreign town. You don't know a whole bunch of what's going on. Traffic lights, where do I turn? What's on the left side? What's on the right side? And you're looking around and you're confused by all these choices you have. And then you have to deal with thousands of other people in the same situation as you are. They don't know where they're going. They don't live in that town. And they pull out in front of you. They want to sideswipe you, slow down, break in front of you. It's crazy on the outside of the car. But you know what? It's also sometimes crazy on the inside of the car when you don't know where you're going. And a lot of people in life... And their spiritual lives are just like this. They get in a car of life and they take down a road that looks appealing and they're confused and they're frustrated. You know why? Because they never thought about where that road is taking them. And King Solomon says, boys and girls, ponder where you're going. Think about where that road is taking you to. Plan ahead. And a lot of times we know that there are certain roads that are bad because of life's experiences. Some people know, okay, if I go to this road, something bad's going to happen. If I go to this road, I'm going to have sorrow and sadness. But yet, when we don't ponder in our mind where we're going and say, I'm going this route, sometimes the car just kind of gravitates itself. There's like a gravitational pull towards certain roads. Roads that we know would lead to destruction. It's not that we necessarily chose those roads, but just society, kind of the flow of the car, the flow of traffic just kind of takes us in that direction. Reminds me of what a great man told me years ago. He said, Pete, if you do not want to fall down, don't walk in slippery places. And there are a lot of people who say, I don't want to go down to these bad roads. I don't want to settle there. But they find themselves there. Why? Because they're associated with people that lead them down a path of destruction. And sometimes it's a place just hanging out in a certain area where you see temptation. So we, we should ponder where the, our roads are taking us. And we should think about the destination, where it's going but also where to persevere. Because King Solomon says, don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left. Stay on the right track. And a lot of people find themselves on the wrong roads in life. Why? Because they find themselves in slippery places because of the people they associate themselves with or the fact that they just don't see a problem in certain places and their negative influences on their lives. These last few weeks at Calvary Baptist, we've had people come in by the hundreds. Some of them are wearing masks. A lot of them are not touching people, staying away. You know, this social distancing is being practiced at least as, as, as much as it can with, with many people. And you know why they're doing this? Because they don't want to have germs and bacteria. This virus jump on top of them because it's very contagious. And you know, in the physical, in the medical world, no one has called Pete Boyd and said, Hey, Pete, you're healthy and attractive. Woo, a beautiful man but you're healthy. Why don't you come down these hallways at Wayne Memorial Hospital and spread your health? We know that it doesn't work that way. Viruses are contagious, but health is not. In the spiritual world, it works the same way. Holiness is not contagious, but sin is. We, that's why King Solomon says to stay away. He says, stay away from these bad paths, these paths that are going to take you down the wrong road. You have to ponder. You've got to persevere. Those are the things you need to do. But what else? You also have a choice in what you say. He talks about a forward mouth, perverted lips. Somebody who's not speaking God's truth. Somebody who's got things twisted. They're corrupted. And we know there are a lot of people in today's world that have twisted thinking, but also a twisted speech. And some of you may say, well, look, you know, I really don't interact with a lot of people face to face. So I'm really not talking to a lot of people. Oh, what about social media? How many of us are putting posts out there or saying things to people for, for God and country and everybody to read and we don't think about what we say? We don't think about the long-term effects that it has. A lot of people are rushing to social media to say what they feel. They get upset and they respond and react. And they're not careful about the things they say. 
We need to be very careful in the choices that we make in terms of the words we use. God wants you to glorify him, but he also wants you to edify your brothers and sisters. And a lot of us, quite simply, we don't do that a lot. We're not saying the right things because we're making bad choices. An old boss told me, he said, Pete, Facebook and social media hires no one, but sure does fire a lot of people. Be careful of the choices you make with the things you say. Nothing you say is by accident. Jesus says that out of the ex excess or the excess of your heart comes words that you speak and words that you choose to use. That's why it's got to be based on the things you study. You better study the Bible. You better study the Bible. And last, in terms of this slide, in terms of choices, you also have a choice in what you see. King Solomon refers to let your eyes look right on. Let your eyelids to look straight before you. It is easy for your eyes to take you off the road. People that are driving their vehicles and get on their phones or get distracted by things they see on the side, boy, you can wreck a lot of things in life. You can hurt a lot of people, including yourself and those inside of your car. But be careful of the things you see. Think about the Old Testament. There are three key people here who got distracted by what they saw. The first woman on earth, Eve, in the Garden of Eden, you look in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, two times it says that her eyes saw certain things, and that pulled her away from obeying what God told Adam. Think about Lot, who Peter said was a just man. He separates from Abraham because there's contention between he and his uncle. And why does he choose the valley in front of Sodom, in front of Gomorrah? You know why? Because he saw that it was well watered and he saw that it was like the Garden of Eden. It was as if it was like being back in Egypt again where everything was beautiful and fertile. And you look at King David, the greatest Jewish king up until the time Jesus reigns. While his men are all fighting in the season of war, he's at home sleeping in. And he walks out from a, a sleep during the middle of the day and he looks out in, in the early evening. And who does he see? He sees Bathsheba, beautiful woman. And he lusts with her with his eyes. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little eyes what you see. My friend, if you study God's word, it's going to impact the rest of these decisions. It helps pave the way for you to make good decisions. So let's apply it to our lives here. What have you been studying this week? Have you been on, in God's word at all? And how much, if you have been in God's word, how much time have you been denoting to God, to the study of God's word? Have you spent more time on social media than you have in, in the book? Have you spent more time watching television than in the book? Those are questions you need to answer. If you're serious about living a life for Jesus, and you're serious about making good decisions, my friends, you need to get on the right path in terms of what you study. Where have your feet taken you this week? Every step that you took this week, did you glorify God in those steps? Or did you run to mischief? Did you run to gossip? Where have your feet taken you? But also, what kind of words have you been using this week? If you've been in God's word, you've been sharing God's word. If you've been praising Jesus, you're going to talk about Jesus. What's been the main topic of your speech patterns in the last week? What do you plan on talking about this week? Do you plan on sharing God with you? You better get in the book. And then lastly, what have you been looking at this week? What have your eyes seen? It's not necessarily that you pursued it. But King Solomon says you need to focus straight on. And that's like putting blinders on, not being distracted by what pops up on the Internet, by what pops up in conversations with other, other people. No, oh, those are questions that are very important to answer. My friend, you have choices, but also you need to know this. You have concessions. A concession means it's a trade-off. If there are two roads, you have a road to the left and a road to the right. If I take the road to the right, I am conceding those things that are on the left. I'm trading off those things and vice versa. And there are really only two paths in life. You can either live according to God's wisdom or you can live according to man's way. So what are you conceding when you choose God's wisdom way? These are people. This is things that you're missing out. If you're living for Jesus Christ and living for God and seeking his wisdom, you're missing out on what most of the world is receiving. What are the lost people in carnal Christians? What are they receiving? Well, one thing that they receive or think they have is control. 
Most sin goes back to pride. And what does pride say? Not what you want, Father God. Not what you want, authority. But it's what I want. It's me being in control. And most people yearn for control. Think about when you were a teenager about to leave high school. Couldn't wait to get out of mama and daddy's house. Because you wanted to be in control of when you went to bed and where you went off to and what you ate. And then the bills start coming in. And then you want to go back home. Or is that just me? Hmm. But if you seek to live life according to your way, you think you're in control. You know what else you have? You have cheer. Let me tell you, sin is fun, but it has a shelf life. Sin is fun. It is enticing. There is something to getting high off abusing alcohol or drugs. There's something to it, you know, seeking lust and fulfilling it with your body with somebody else. And think about all these other vices out there. They're fun for a season. We read that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, dealing with Moses. If you seek God's way, you are conceding control of your life. You're conceding cheer. But remember, there's a difference between happiness and joy. People who live life according to what they want, they have happiness, they have cheer. But remember, it doesn't last, it's fleeting. It doesn't last long. And another thing that we're giving up when we seek to live by God's wisdom, what are we conceding? We're conceding convenience. The world who is lost, carnal Christians who act lost, they live a convenient life. To live for God takes moral courage. To live life the way you want to is cowardice. Yeah, I said it. Most people want to have a convenient life. They don't want to have to wrestle with what is right and what is wrong. They just want to do what feels good and what they want because they're living a life of convenience. When I first looked at these scriptures, I said, let's do a word search of choice, cho chosen, choose, select, selection, choice. And you know, the most common use of, of those terms in the Bible was when people were looking to select soldiers to fight. And people who live life for themselves live a life of convenience. There is no fight. There is no struggle between what their flesh wants to do and what God's Spirit is calling them to do. It's a life of convenience. But let me tell you who Jesus is looking for. He's not looking for people who seek convenience. God is looking for soldiers who are willing to fight for Him. Think about that. These are things that you're giving up. If you do things God's way. Well, what are you giving up if you do things God's way? All right. I'm sorry. What are some things that you're conceding when you choose to do it your own way? These are things that we Christians who are seeking to live life by God's way, by God's truth. These are things that we conceded on the last slide. Now let's flip flop it. People are missing out on these things when they live for self. One is they're missing out on intimacy. You can stop here, not even worry about two and three. But people who seek to live life according to God's truth, we have an intimacy with God himself. God knows everything about us, and he wants us to know things about him. And that's where intimacy comes in. You cannot be intimate with God doing things your own way. The greatest gift that we have as Christians who are seeking a spirit-filled life is that we have an intimacy that no... No amount of money could buy. No amount of sweat can buy and blood and guts. This is things that God will give us for free if we simply bow the knee to him. But not only do we receive intimacy as followers who are seeking his wisdom, we also gain investment. Living for Jesus pays off today. If you live for self, you know, you are getting a payday, but it's just then and there. And it won't last forever because what you do for self dies when, when, when you die. But our lives for Jesus, we're getting paid today, but we're also going to be paid in the future. We're investing into eternity. These are things that we gain as followers of Jesus who are seeking to live things according to God's, God's wisdom. We're gaining intimacy. We're gaining investment. If you're not living that way, you're losing. You're conceding these things. And this last little, little square right here, oh my goodness, you're going to think, Pete, you're nuts. It's the opposite of what you're saying. You know what else we gain? We gain independence. And you may say this, how is it possible, man, how is it possible that we can give our lives over to Jesus and we gain independence? That doesn't make sense. Well, think about it. When I was lost, or when I am a carnal Christian who's doing things my own way, I become a slave to sin. 
We as believers on Christ and who are following God's wisdom, we have the freedom to live life as we should and as we would. Because Jesus changes our want to. We sin all that we want. In fact, we sin more than we want because we want to be pleasing to God. Oh, my friend, I have great freedom in living for Jesus. You know why? Because I don't have to worry about direction. God gives me direction. I don't have to worry about my purpose in life. He gives me my purpose. I don't have to worry about enemies. God takes care of my enemies. I don't have to worry about bitterness. God can take care of that for me. I don't have to worry about guilt. He's given that to Jesus. I don't have to worry about destruction and damnation. He's given it to his son Jesus and judged him at the cross for those things. I am free to live life for him. There's no independent living outside of Jesus. These are things you're conceding if you do things your own way. So here we go. Question, what are you trading in today? We're all making a trade-off. You're either trading in spiritual things or earthly things. What are you trading in? Ponder your steps and ponder your choices here. We must move on. You have control. This is the key. This is the key. There's only one verse, and it's the biggest verse we have here. You have control. Let's talk about where this control comes from. This control comes from verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence. That means you got to work at it. For out of your heart are the issues of life. Now, the heart itself, there are three things I want to say about the heart. First thing, you need to know that the heart in the Bible is usually a symbol. 99.99% of the time, it's not talking about the organ that pumps blood throughout the body. It's talking about your soul. The heart is the center of your soul. And what is the soul? What is your heart? Your heart and soul. It makes up your emotions, your desires, your willpower, your personality. It's the way you feel. That's what the heart symbolizes. And Solomon says, keep your heart with all diligence. Put a barrier, protect it. Guard your heart, in other words. Guard your heart. But not only is it a symbol, it's also a source. When I witnessed to someone who was lost, Somebody's on drugs, somebody who's fornicating, somebody who, who's into alcohol abuse and cursing and all those things and violence and watching bad stuff. I don't talk to him or her. Well, you shouldn't cuss. Hey, you shouldn't sleep around. Hey, you shouldn't get high. I, I don't tell them that because the problem is not their sin. Let's look at what Jesus said. <coughs> Excuse me, Matthew 15. Jesus said, look, all these evil thoughts, all these murders and adulteries and fornications, Feet, these thefts and these lies and these blasphemes. All of this comes from the heart. Not, it comes out of the heart. It doesn't come out of the hands and the eyeballs. It comes out of the human heart. Because Jesus knew what Jeremiah said in chapter 17, verse 9. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Do you know that you don't even know how dark and how black your human heart is? The nature that is within you just because you were born of the seed of a woman? Your heart is deceitful. Even you don't know the depth of your heart. Think about David. I'm telling you, David woke up from that bed whoo, in the middle of the day. Late afternoon, early evening. He had no idea he was going to commit adultery. He had no idea he was going to murder. He had no idea he was going to cause civil war in his own house. He had no idea because your heart is deceitful. And it talks about it is desperately wicked. A lot of people play the victim card. We're not victims. We're sinners. Your heart is evil. My heart is evil. I don't know the depths, but who does? Only God knows the depths of our heart. I know a lot of people have been talking about police and defund the police. I wish we didn't have to have policemen, but I love policemen. <laughs> Something's wrong in my life. I'm giving them a call and giving a little tip on the side too, right? The greatest policeman is not the one down the street over here in front of CVS. It's not those wonderful men and women that serve in our police department over here in the precinct over here by our church. The best policemen are not out here in the streets or in the precinct. You know where the best policeman is? He's in your heart. We need heart transplants. We need a policeman on the inside. And that's where salvation in Christ and being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, who is the seal of our salvation, that's where we can really get some good done. Because let me, let me go ahead and go on to the third part. The heart can be a servant. You say, what does that mean? All right. When you get a heart transplant... That's where you become a believer and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and he starts to change your soul through your spirit. Your spirit is what is revitalized when you get saved. It's through my spirit that Jesus has made alive through trusting him. That's what enables me to communicate with God. 
And that's how we have that intimacy is through our spirits. But the Holy Spirit can transform your soul by causing your spirit to direct your heart. Your heart is a tool. It can be used. It is a servant to your spirit if you allow it to be. But a lot of us, we're not living in the spirit. We're living according to the, how we feel and what we think. We, we are, have a lot of people who are living on, based on their souls. They are soul-driven and not spirit-driven. Your heart is a symbol. It deals with the centerpiece of your soul. It is the source of sin because your heart is evil. But when you get saved, your heart can become a servant. King Solomon says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As long as you're being driven by the Spirit of God, your heart can be a great servant. Heart and money are similar in these things. They can be super servants or they can be morbid masters. And we choose as Christians which way those things are going to go. That's why Solomon says to keep your heart. It takes work. So here's our question. What steps can you take this week to guard your heart? It starts with an old song that goes something like this. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. You know the rest of these words. Come on. The Bible is your source of how to keep your heart pure. How do you be diligent in barring it up and sheltering it? It takes work. It takes work. That's why so few people keep, keep it. And our last point, I got to hurry. You have consequences. Concessions are trade-offs. Consequences are what do I get when I go down a certain path? Here we go. If I'm living according to God's wisdom, if I'm walking in God's way, there are three things that I gain. And we'll use the NASB for some of this because it's worded better. First thing that you receive is your load will be mitigated. Now, most people don't, don't use that word mitigate a lot, but it means to lessen, to lighten the load. <clears throat> when you get saved, God takes things out of your life that's going to hinder you. Now, that's not saying you don't have problems, because we all have problems, because we live in a cursed world, in a fallen world. But God supernaturally will make your way straight, and he'll take out barriers, because that's how awesome of a God we have. But also this, your light will be multiplied. It talks about in verse 18 how you imagine the light at daybreak when your sun rises in the east and you see a little bit of light. Then all of a sudden the light spreads and goes everywhere at noon and 1 and 2 o'clock where it's super hot. But that's where you get the most sun during the day, right? The sun starts off smaller and then it gets larger during the course of the day. When you're obedient to God's word and walk in his wisdom, God will give you more light. Because you're obedient, he will give you more. Look at John 7 verse 17. If you want to know my doctrine, you need to obey the word. The more you obey God's word, the more truth he reveal from his word and more truth he reveal about himself. Obey what you do know and you'll be given more. Your light is multiplied. Oh, got to keep going. Your life will be mended. Look at back at our lesson from two weeks ago. We talked about health. It talks about this, babies, that when you get saved, that you're going to find a new health. You're not going to live forever physically, but you will spiritually, of course, and in your soul. But we talked about how God's word brings health to our bodies, living, think, living according to God's truth and his ways. Life will be better. All right? Go back and look that up last couple of weeks. What are the consequences when we reject God's way and we're living according to wickedness? The Bible says in this chapter, in this passage, three things for them. Number one is this, that sleep hides from the wicked. I mean, they literally sleep, <clears throat> but they don't have joy. They don't have peace. Why is that? Because they, they live a life of mischief and they want to cause harm to other people. That's how they get their jollies during the day. And even though they may sleep, they don't sleep with rest. And they don't sleep with peace because God does not give rest to the wicked. What else does God not do? He's not going to allow them to eat and be full. The sustenance that the wicked eat harms them. Think about this. They eat the bread of wickedness. That's what they eat. They consume evil deeds and they drink the wine of violence. It's amazing how this Sunday, June 28th, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And that body is the broken, that bread is the bro broken body of Jesus Christ, the perfect sinless Son of God. They broke him at, at Calvary. They broke him. And when we eat of Jesus' pain and suffering, we receive life. Oh, when we drink of the cup, it symbolizes the blood of Jesus. We're drinking life. We're drinking purity. We're drinking Jesus. Jesus allowed himself to be broken and hurt to bring joy and salvation to everyone who trusts. But the wicked are opposite. 
They don't take on suffering. They call suffering to please themselves alone. And my friend, when you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Sustenance will harm the wicked, but also closing. Stumbling hinders the wicked. Their way is the way of darkness. They don't know what they stumble at. Human history is filled with people. And you read this in Psalms and Proverbs. How the wicked, they dig a pit. What? So people can fall into it. But who falls in it? They fall into their own pit. They set a trap or a snare to catch somebody. They themselves get caught in this. That's how God set up the universe. Yeah, they may win today, but they're losing the war. And my friend, the wicked people, and if you're a carnal Christian, you're not going to stand up and do whatever you want to do forever. You're going to stumble. Think about Haman in the book of Esther. He created a device to kill Mordecai because he hated the Jews so much. Well, he hated Mordecai so much, so he hated the Jewish people. But there's a background more to that as well. But anyway, Haman dies the same way that he wanted to kill Mordecai. Look at Hitler in the 20th century. He hated the Jews. He hated other people, but he wanted to, he was just the, the epitome of a racist. He believed in a master race, which was his people, the German people, the Aryan race. And he wanted to enslave millions of people in Eastern Europe for living space. And he ends up committing suicide because he's a coward, just like Satan is. Cowards. Oh, my friend, think about the future. The Antichrist, he will persecute Israel more than anybody has ever persecuted Israel before in the history of the world. And he doesn't win in the end. In the end, he's thrown into the lake of fire. Oh, my friend, if you're wicked, you're not going to have rest. You're not going to be full. And you're not going to stand because God is against you. Oh, I hope you're making good choices. <clears throat> so our last question. Which set of consequences finds you today? Are you enjoying the blessings of living a spirit-filled life, walking according to God's wisdom? Or are you a wicked person who's lost? Or are you a carnal Christian who's living life according to the way you want to? It's not going to turn out the way you think. I love you. Let's pray us out. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for your word. I pray that somebody somewhere gets something out of this lesson to apply to their lives, that they'll be more like Jesus. And they'll have freedom and a fullness to their life, dear Lord. And I pray that somebody's lost, that you'll convict them, that they need to trust Jesus. Oh, Lord, if there are people out there who are spirit-led and spirit-filled, may they be encouraged to know God is with them and they're making good choices. Lord, I pray for us as a church. I pray for us as a nation, as a community. Lord, we got more and more people will come to Christ. That's the only way to fix the mess we're in. Thank you, dear Lord, for this time. And we ask it in your Son's name and in the Spirit. Amen. I hope you have a great week. See you soon.